Our next session is Oracle Data Redaction is Broken, and your speaker is David Litchfield. Thank you. Okay, so I'm guessing everyone missed the memo, you know? So uh, those at the back, if you want to come forward, you know, it makes me feel like I've actually got an audience to speak to today, you know? <laughs> okay, so who am I? Uh, my name's David Litchfield. I've uh, been an IT security consultant for a very, very long time. Um, I'm currently working for an organization out of Australia called Datacom TSS. Uh, I used to work for some uh, American companies, and uh, a while back I set up my own company, NGS, which uh, sold to NCC, uh, back in 2008. So I, my job used to be to, to break into systems. Uh, essentially, uh, a c and &E specialist. You know, we would have clients who would come along and say, uh, please do this kind of assessment for us, and you know, we would tell them where the problems are and how we got in and everything like that. I started out in buffer overflow exploitation. Uh, back in 1999, I wrote a paper on uh, a buffer overflow vulnerability in the Razman service on Windows NT, and I knew at the time I discovered one of these magical buffer overflow vulnerabilities, you know, you could execute arbitrary commands and everything like that, because I'd read a paper by um, ALF1, you know, smashing the stack for fun and profit. And I was like, right, I found one of these super duper magical things. How do I go about exploiting that now? So as I learned the process, I documented that buffer overflow for beginners and stuff and uh, moved on from there. So when it came to um, 2003 and Microsoft had started implementing the GS flag in the compiler, I spent some time reverse engineering what was going on and wrote a, um, a couple of techniques to, to bypass their stack protection stuff and uh, safe SEH, safe uh, structured exception handling. To be fair, that's probably the pinnacle of my career. I don't think I've done anything that, since that, in computer security anyway, since, uh, since that time. Because, hey, I moved into database security, and it's trivial, it's easy, and, uh, well, it should be really called database insecurity. Uh, I'm an author. I've written the Oracle Hackers Handbook, the Database Hackers Handbook, and um, some chapters in the Shell Coders Handbook, the first edition. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, I can be followed at dlitchfield on Twitter, or if you actually want to have a conversation offline, I can be emailed at david.litchfield at datacom.com.au. With that over, I want to set the the, the, the groundwork uh, for this talk. So uh, recently, uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, the Oracle CEO, uh, Mr. Larry Ellison, said, to the best of his knowledge, an Oracle database has not been broken into for a couple of decades by anybody. To be fair, he said the same thing 10 years ago, and at that time, he said 10 years. Now, who remembers the Sony PlayStation Network breach in 2011? That, that's running Oracle. The fact that the biggest data breach to, to, at that time, that the, the senior management at Oracle is not aware that that was an Oracle database server is, is awful as far as I'm concerned. The management, senior management, should know of every single breach, especially their biggest customers, when, and, you know, when they're happening or when they're discovered at least. Uh, the Oracle CSO said at one point, Customers should hold their vendors to a very high standard. The only way you can hold your vendor accountable is through your pocketbook. In other words, if your vendor is failing you, vote with your checkbook. Don't buy their products if their products are crap. So we'll do some, some history. How I got into um, uh, some of my checkered history with database research anyway, and, and some of the, the, the problems I've had with Oracle in the past. We'll be talking about Oracle Data Redaction at the very end of this, and I'm using Data Redaction as an example of how they've not actually made any improvements, uh, and it's 2014. The rest of the world got the idea a long time ago. So who remembers a hacker called RFP, one of the great researchers of his time? I know he's still around and everything like that. Um, but he, he wrote some really cool white papers on like how I hacked WW threads and everything like that. And it was using things like SQL injection. And that, I didn't know anything about databases at the time, so I started researching databases because of the, the work RFP was doing. And uh, a, a colleague of mine, Chris Anley, and I were doing an assessment for one of our clients. This is back in uh, uh, 2000. And we, we basically broke in through a SQL injection attack. and. Uh, basically extended what was known at the time using things like you know, group by clauses to, to get information about the database structure. And I wrote a paper on this called ODBC um, uh, Web Application Disassembly with ODBC Error Messages. And it was one of the, the first few papers on SQL injection. Uh, and that, then I uh, did some work on Microsoft SQL Server. Um, again, there was myself, Chris Anley, 
and a guy called Cesar Serrado, who at that time were beating the crap out of, of Microsoft SQL Server. And uh, I found a couple of buffer overflows in there, well, more than a couple. Uh, specifically, though, one of those was exploited by the Slammer one. Who remembers what happened on January the 5th, uh, 2003? Slammer, of course, it probably a lot of people got angry, call, you know, like three o'clock in the morning, come and fix our, you know, internet, it's broken somehow. That was probably Slammer. And, and indeed, um, large portions of like South Korea disappeared off, off the net for a wee while because of it. Uh, and I, I, when I found the, the flaw that Slammer ended up exploiting, um, I worked with Microsoft uh, and they, they you know, got a, a fix out. And it was at Black Hat 2002, actually, in uh, crumbs 14 years ago, or uh, 12 years ago, rather. I'm getting old. Uh, that uh, I, I spoke about the flaw that Slammer was exploiting. I said, if you don't fix this, this will become the next big worm. And three, six months later, um, Slammer, Slammer came out. But then, at about that time, Larry Ellison turned around and said his products were unbreakable. And when a hacker hears something like that, you do an about turn and you say, what, you know? People talk about the assassination of uh, John Kennedy. Everyone can remember what they were doing at the time when they heard that John Kennedy did, had, had been killed. That was the same for me when Larry Ellison said his product was unbreakable. I remember exactly what I was doing, and it was looking up from my keyboard going, what? So my, my attention and my brother's attention turned to, to Oracle. And within a day, we had sent Oracle um, about 35 critical flaws, most of them not requiring a user ID and password to, to gain full control of, and thus begun my relationship with Oracle. And I'm going to skip a lot of this because it's really quite boring. Actually, no, let's go over this. So one of the flaws which was really interesting, and this, this speaks to about the way Oracle approaches security. One of the flaws uh, is the launching of external procedures. Now, for those that don't know Oracle too well, the, as in the RDBMS, essentially what happens is you have PLSQL, which sort of extends the features of uh, SQL, uh, and it's pro programmable, it's a procedural language and everything like that. And essentially what you can do is if what you want to do, you can't do in PLSQL. You can shell out to uh, a shared DLL, a, a, a library, and have some C code do that for you. Now, the way in which that works is the PL SQL package turns around and says, uh, you know, connects to the TNS listener. The Oracle database connects to the TNS listener and says, please load this library, execute this function, and pass it these parameters. And the TNS listener goes, well, no, 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 I won't do that. But I, I know a program who will, and that's called Xproc. So Xproc goes ahead, loads the library, executes the function, and you know, uh, with the, the, the supplied parameters. So you can just look at that and think, well, there is no authentication taking place there. And so if I'm across the other side of the network, I can connect to the TNS listener and pretend to be the Oracle RDBMS process and say, will you load this library for me and execute this function? and uh, you know, pass it these parameters. And uh, you know, lo and behold, when you connect, TNS listen turns around and said, well, no, no, I won't do it for you, but I know a program that will. And it goes ahead and faithfully launches Xproc, and Xproc loads the library and executes the function. So of course, someone could load libc or msvcrt.dll and execute the system function, passing it command, uh, you know, whatever command they want it to run. So on Windows, that runs as local system, and you can, you know, you have complete control if it's, uh, running on a, a Unix-based system like Linux or whatever, then it's going to run as the Oracle user, or, or it did at the time. It's now should be running as nobody. But so I sent this to Oracle, and they they attempted to fix it, and they fixed it on certain versions, but left other versions uh, vulnerable uh, because they decided that those products were no longer going to be supported uh, anyway. So their fix basically said, well, what we'll do is allow the person to still connect to us and attempt to load the library, but ha, ah, we'll be cunning about it. We'll log it. Uh, we'll log the attempt. So if you send a, um, an overly long library name, there's a buffer overflow with a, an unsafe call to sprintf. So we could still gain control without a username and password when it's you know, logging it, basically, by exploiting the, the buffer overflow in S, uh, uh, sprintf. So we sent that bug to Oracle, and they fixed that one too. And they put some length checking in there. And what they do now, or did at the time, was say, what's the length of the, the library being requested by the user? If it's over 256, deny the request. Don't even log it. We'll just, we'll just drop it. If it's less than 256 characters, we'll, we'll go ahead and log it, log the attempt. But before they do the call, the unsafe call to, SN print, uh, to sprintf, 
They, yeah, they didn't change it. They didn't patch it by calling SNPrintf and specifying the number of bytes to copy. They, they left the SPrintf in there, the dangerous one. And, uh, but before they did the logging, what they did was expand any environment variables in there. So they do the length check first, and then they expand the environment variables. So if you have dollar sign path in there, that expands to the length of the path. So basically, we have five characters um, extending to potentially you know, 200, 300, or whatever. So guess what? After the length check, and through the expansion of environment variables, we can still gain, over, uh, uh, gain control over the process as path of execution simply by, again, exploiting the, the unsafe call to sprint f. They attempted to fix it again, and there was another flaw. Uh, but let, let's move on from there. I want to give you another example. Uh, this, uh, that was about you know, uh, three years it, it, you know, to get to the point where it's still vulnerable. So Oracle Application Server, you know, it's a common web server. Uh, essentially, there's a thing in it called the mod PL SQL gateway. It's, it's actually quite good. And it, you know, essentially what it does, it allows you to program a, a web application in PL SQL uh, and have those calls executed over the web. But the way in which it operates is a web user will make a request, you know, www.example.com slash pls slash dad, the name of the PL SQL package, dot the name of the procedure, and any parameters that are, question, you know, in the, in the query string, question mark query string kind of. So, and what the web server essentially does is takes that and goes, there you go, database server, execute that for me. So no, with no validation. So if you know there's a vulnerable package and uh, the name of a vulnerable procedure, we can just execute it directly. So that, that was definitely a big risk. So I, I sent that to Oracle, and they, they pr uh, protected it by having the, the PLSQL exclusion list. And on that list is anything in the sys schema, anything that starts with OWA, because there was like um, OWA um, underscore util dot cells print, which allowed us to run arbitrary SQL queries and so on. There's a whole bunch of OWA packages which are there to support the building of web applications that had dangerous functionality in there or simple cross-site scripting, http.p, question mark, cbuff, cross-site scripting attack, so to speak, you know? Uh, that's the, the http.p uh, is they just simply print this HTML out. So they come up with this PL SQL exclusion bypass, uh, uh, not bypass list, exclusion list. And uh, it was trivial to bypass initially by just passing a space, you know? So you go percent 20, name of package, name of procedure. And the database server would go, yep, Percent 20 is a space, but we're going to do the validation on that now. And of course, that's not on the list. That you know, space sys is, is not on the list, so we pass it through, and the, uh, again, we can gain access to everything in the sys schema. So I sent that to Oracle, and they fixed it. Oh, sorry, at the same time, of course, uh, a new line character, percent 0a would work, of course, and percent 0d. Uh, so they, they, and, and a tab, of course, 0, 09. So they went ahead and fixed that. And then... Um, they, I, we were doing a pen test, and uh, this customer had Oracle Application Server, and uh, we had to, to bypass the exclusion list again to, you know, to do various things. Um, and it suddenly struck me that there's other ways to bypass it. Um, so, like, if we in quote sys in double quotes, well, that's valid SQL as far as the, the backend is concerned. But hey, guess what? It breaks the 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 the, um, the, the exclusion list on the uh, the web front end. There's another way of doing it. So here, here, here's, who runs, who's ever run CharMap, you know, the character map application on a, on a Windows system? It gives you all the, the ASCII characters and, and so on. What character is FF, hex FF? Anybody? It's like a Y with an umlaut on top of it. So I was like, no, nah, they're not going to be that silly, are they? So S, percent FF, S, dot, basically, that gets, when the web server receives that, the, the web server goes, nope, that's not on the exclusion list, but SYS is, of course, but SY with an umlaut S is not on the exclusion list, so let's go ahead and pass it to the back end. The database server, depending upon the character set, says, I've just received this request for a funny-looking Y, you know, with SY. Maybe they didn't mean that. Maybe they actually meant the letter Y. So let's change the Y with an umlaut, you know, the character FF, to the letter Y. So again, we could uh, gain control of the, you know, the, the back end through the, the, by passing the list. So eventually, after about five or six of these, um, you know, year one, I send it, you know, bypass again, year two. In fact, there was another time where the, there was a, a couple of flaws in uh, the MD sys schema. And the only way you could actually leverage these was basically through, you know, the risk was presented through an Oracle application server. And they said, well, yeah, you, you'd need to bypass the exclusion list again to e exploit that. Uh, and I said, well, 
in the past, we've had about five or six ways of doing it. Are you sure there's not any more? And we're like, yeah, we're, we're, we're good. We're not going to fix these flaws in the MDC schema. And so I was like, damn you guys. And tap, 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 tap. Sent them within five minutes a new way to bypass the, um, the list. This time, it, angle bracket, angle bracket. Label, angle bracket, angle bracket. Basically, it's a, a go-to label. So again, that would bypass the, you know, break the, the pattern checking and, and so on. Eventually, they fixed the MDC stuff and that new bypass and eventually said, stop. We clearly have failed miserably on doing the validation on the web front end. Let's get the database server to do the validation. Yeah, well, that's a good idea, isn't it? You know, the database server, the place where we're executing code or attempting to execute code is now enforcing it. So guess what was vulnerable to SQL injection? Their validation code on the back end database server so we could, get, again, gain uh, arbitrary code execution on the, on the back end database server. So over the years, there's been some really quirky patches come out from Oracle. So back in, the, back in the days of like 2005, 2006 and so on, you would send them a proof of concept code when you discovered a flaw and they would fix the exploit by making sure the exploit didn't work but not actually fix the unknown underlying flaw. And one of the examples of this is if the input has a space in it, which is my exploit did, uh, reject it. Not thinking that of course we can replace a space with comment delimiters, or a double pipe for concatenation or whatever. So again, we could trivial, you know, so you wait two years for a fix to come from Oracle, and the fix is broken and trivial to bypass. Um, sometimes their fix is used as secret. So they would have a, a really long string of random characters, and if you supplied that as one of the parameters, you could do, you know, you could execute the arbitrary SQL kind of thing. So rather than not, not realizing, of course, that hackers have the ability to like, reverse engineer things and, and extract secrets, so you know, we, we exploit it again just by passing the secret once we've reverse engineered it. Uh, oh, another very typical one is you would find a vulnerability, and two lines later, you, you know, in, in the same bit of code, you would have exactly the same kind of flaw that they didn't fix. And again, these, these are the things where you wait a year or two years to get fixed, and the, 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 the fix is not uh, good enough. And sometimes their critical patch updates would actually replace uh, fixed code with broken code. It, they would, if, if a user had attempted to defend themselves by dropping vulnerable objects, well, the patch would come along and replace those objects. So if they, and if those patches had flaws in themselves, then suddenly that person, all their hard work done on locking down that database has been undone by those objects being recreated. They are a lot better today. Um, but still, still a long way to go. So between the years 2000 and 2014, specifically for the RDBMS itself, none of the other products in Oracle, I'm not, not talking about Java here, uh, I'm not talking about the, the application server or eBusiness Suite or anything like that, just specifically the RDBMS. This is the graph of patches. Now each one of these blue blocks basically represents something with a CVE ID behind it essentially. So we can see back in about the um, year 2004, quarter two, 2004, they were fixing things on an ad hoc basis. So, you know, we had alert one, two, three, alert, all the way up to, I think it was like uh, 50 odd or something at the time. And they decided because of the volume of bugs that were being found in their products that they were no longer going to do this ad hoc patching thing. I think they were getting a lot of complaints from customers. They were going to do uh, a quarterly patch uh, update, which is, which is good thinking. They were copy So first off, they slagged off Microsoft for adopting this policy, and then a couple of years later, they're doing it themselves. Go figure. So suddenly, in like the, the, the tail end of 2004, we see all these bugs being fixed, basically, which is great that they're being fixed. And over time, we can see the graph today is, is, is almost leveling off. You know, maybe there's uh, every critical patch update that comes up, there's two or three or five. Long gone are the days where 50 bugs are being fixed, well, 28 in a, in a, in a single critical patch update. Uh, for Microsoft SQL Server, for all their versions, this is the same graph over the same time period. So here, in 2000, uh, end of 2002, uh, beginning of 2003, is where Bill Gates sent out his trustworthy computing memo. They turned around and said, we've been dropping the ball, we really need to fix this and improve our processes. And indeed, they came up with, with the SDLC. 
uh, the circuit just created the development life cycle. Now, another interesting story about this period of time is because of all the flaws that had been discovered in SQL Server uh, by people like Chris Anley, myself, Cesar Serrata, and all those guys, uh, they turned, Microsoft said, stop development of Yukon. Yukon was the code name for SQL Server 2005. So they, they actually got the whole development team off Yukon to do a code review of SQL Server 2000. Bill Gates basically authorized that and said, look, we, we need to improve because we're going to be hemorrhaging customers. So the sole reason that the, this side of the graph is, is, is as empty as it is is because of the security development life cycle. They've, Microsoft, that is, you know, has, has done wonders. So I just want to compare them again. Oracle versus Microsoft. And I, and I think there's some, some key things that we can take away from SDL here. The stuff I'm going to be talking about in terms of the Oracle data redaction and why it's broken, if Oracle had followed any decent kind of security development lifecycle, as opposed to just paying lip service, the flaws that I'm about to speak about would have been caught at every single one of these stages of SDLC. So established security requirements, attack surface analysis, and so on, all the way through to the very last stage, um, conduct a final security review, pen test the product before it goes live. Now we'll see, this, the stuff I'm about to talk about is not riot, rocket science, you know? I used to like do buffer overflow exploitation and defeat stack protection and safe SCH and everything. This stuff is kindergarten stuff. No one should be releasing a product in their flagship product, Oracle uh, 12C, that, with these kind of flaws. They should, be, they should have learned this lesson a long time ago. In fact, before I, I, saw, I sort of went into semi-retirement, and uh, I, at that time I gave Oracle a B plus. They were actually doing really, really well. So I'm, I'm being slightly unfair uh, to, a, to a certain extent because they actually um, have done great uh, work in terms of improving the security of their products. So PL SQL injection flaws are almost entirely gone now. Indeed, if there are any, it's th through things like numeric lateral SQL injection. It's things like um, PLSQL race conditions. They're very edge cases, you know. Uh, I have about... 15, since starting uh, back into Oracle Research back in November, I, I, I think I've still got about 15 outstanding issues that are waiting to be patched. Some critical, some not so much. Uh, and yet, it's 2014, and I'm still managing to sit down in, in the space of a few minutes and find bugs and send them to, to, to get them fixed. This should not be happening. So let's talk about Oracle Data Redaction. Actually, I wanted to go back here because I don't want to make it sound like a Microsoft fanboy. Uh, same vulnerability you reported two lines further into the code. Who remembers the IRMO activation flaw? Last stages of delirium, a Polish group, found a buffer overflow in DCOM. The IRMO activation was the interface, and you could trivially exploit it to gain uh, you know, code execution without using username and password. It's what Blaster eventually ended up exploiting. Uh, so as it happens, Microsoft fixed the, the code for... The, it was a simple stack-based buffer overflow. But two lines further down in the code, there was a heap-based overflow. Uh, so it's not that you know, missing vulnerabilities is, is simply an Oracle problem. Other vendors, other vendors do it too. By the way, the thing about the Microsoft fanboy thing, I am a fanboy. I do like them. Uh, but uh, just being fair, uh, patches missing, yep. So Oracle data redaction is a really great idea. Basically, we can, if we have sensitive data, we can turn around and hide it from the end user if we, if we so choose, which is great for things like um, if your application might be vulnerable to SQL injection. For example, let's look at eBusiness Suite. Do you, who knows how many JSP files are in an installation of eBusiness Suite? 1,000? Uh, show me, show of hands, 1,000, 2,000, 15,000, 15,000. There's between 15 and 18,000 JSP files. Most of them were written, like in, in 1999, when security wasn't in the dictionary at that time, you know? Uh, and they're, they're still there, they're defunct, but, you know, they might be vulnerable to SQL injection. So here, here's a great thing. We can say, 
you know, uh, our application, web applications might be vulnerable to SQL injection, so let's protect, PI, let's protect PII or confidential stuff and redact that so we don't have to make any changes to our applications, uh, but we can protect it. So if someone snarfs our data, for example, anonymous or lolsec or whoever it happens to be, basically they're, all they're going to get is a list of Xs or something like that. So it's a great idea. Problem is, of course, uh, it's trivial to bypass. So let's actually have some demos. Right. So basically, we're going to first off set up to show you how it works. Uh, we're going to make sure the policy is dropped. I just want to clear up. OK. And then make sure this is dropped. OK, good. Right, so we're going to create a table with a credit card column. Uh, can you guys see that at the back? You can, right, good. Uh, and insert uh, a fake credit card number and then commit that. Uh, Control-C. OK, so if we do select star from redaction. Actually, why am I typing when I can cut and paste? OK, so we can currently, of course, see the credit card number, you know. So we would want to redact that. So what we do is essentially create a redaction policy on it. So and let's give uh, David some, cr some permissions to see that. OK. So now, all as David sees when he logs in, let's say David is the application that's used by the web application to connect. And they're doing a SQL injection attack, and they select you know, from this redaction test table. Uh, then they're not going to get to see the credit card information, because it's all redacted, which is lovely. Uh, the, 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 the problem is, well, there's several problems. Let's, let's go through them individually. So within Oracle, there's a function called XML query. And basically, that allows someone to execute X query. And we can specify the name of a table and the owner uh, and return data from that. Now, one, if you were doing, if you were releasing a new product, a security sensitive product in your flagship database product, you would think someone as part of the SDLC would do a penetration test on it before it goes live, or at any of those other stages dur during a uh, security development lifecycle. Uh, this should have been found before it was shipped. So all we do, basically, is specify the credit card column, and we can get it out. We can get unredact the, uh, the column that's been redacted. So, there, you know, is failure one. Uh, it's a bit unfair, but XML table function is also vulnerable. So there we go. Get the information back out. Uh, another one is uh, if you do an update, sometimes if you have a, uh, a, a column that is automatically updated, for example, with a sequence number or something like that, you do an update through an application, and you need to know what that sequence number is so you can do a returning into subclause of the update statement. Well, of course, you know, anyone who understands SQL would have turned around during a pen test of this product, had they have done one, and said, well, wait a minute, we can get data back out via the returning into subclause, this, this here. And uh, we should probably check that as part of our pen test of Oracle Data Reduction before we ship it. But did they? I guess not, because guess what? So all we're doing is updating the ID column with the same value. So we're not actually updating anything at all. And we can roll this back. Uh, but what we're doing is saying, once you've done the update, return whatever's in the credit card column, the CC column, and stick it into the buffer, and then print that buffer to the screen. So again, we can bypass data reduction using this as a method. Again, had someone done a pen test on this, they would have found this as a, a method of bypassing data redaction. There's a really, really silly uh, way of doing it. So anything in the, in the where clause, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the bit that you, on the end of the, the query, like select star from table, where condition matches such and such kind of thing, the columns cannot be, by nature, protected in there. So uh, Alexander Kornbrust actually uh, pointed out back in November that you could pass, obviously, the column name to UTL uh, HTTP and send out data, exfiltrate 
uh, data that way. And there's a couple of other methods you can do it. Or alternatively, uh, you can just simply brute force it. So what we're going to do here is create a simple function, a procedure rather, that attempts to verify what the data is based upon its, its position in the, in the results. So all we're doing is saying if the first byte of the first row of data is one, print it. If not, move on and try two. And once we, we find the data, we move to the next character. So we do a substring on the second character of the return data set. So basically brute forcing the space. And if we know that it's a credit card, we only have to go through numbers, obviously, zero through nine. And we, you know, we have, the, have them all listed. So uh, let's create the procedure. Sorry? Uh, I don't need to, because I've not really updated anything. But just for. There we go. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so all I've done is created this little procedure that's going to brute force it and then execute it. So we can see, obviously, because it's not protected in the, in the where predicate, we can get this information out. Uh, so there's ways that are clearly trivial to spot. Anyone who's worked at Oracle for the past year and has an understanding of how SQL works should have found these issues. Why weren't they found? And that's really the, you know, telling for me. You know, it's like uh, we're in the year 2014, and they've still not learned the lessons that people were learning in 2003, you know? They... Uh, they often tout their security credentials, Oracle. And I think what they mean by that is security as defined by things like the common criteria. Okay? So the common criteria is the, like the orange book stuff, you know, red book, the IBM. So basically, it's where the government turns around and says, if you follow these kind of uh, development procedures and you go through an evaluation process, uh, we will certify your product as having a high level of assurance. So if we look at Oracle 8.1.7.4, if we look at Oracle 9i release 2, both of those passed to EAL4 plus under the common criteria. And yet, both of those had a buffer overflow in the authentication mechanism by passing an overly long username. So all the things that the common criteria, common criteria speak about, things like you know, having uh, logins and audit facilities and non-repudiation uh, and all this good stuff, is defeated by that one buffer overflow in the authentication stuff. You know, because once we've exploited that buffer overflow, we can turn off auditing, we can turn off non, you know, re repudiation. My actions are not those of a logged in user, they are the actions of the database itself. So, and again, in fairness to Oracle, you know, a, a buffer overflow with an overly long username in the authentic in authentication, Infamix had exactly the same thing. So it's not like Oracle are out there alone, you know, with these kinds of. Uh, you know, issues. Um, and yet they have a pocket full of government authorized credentials that says we have passed, you know, uh, common criteria several times to EAL4+. And I think that's part of the problem is uh, what happens is when you um, are measured against um, the, the, the common criteria, you have a, a, what's known as a protection profile. And the people who wrote the protection profile started off by saying, the installation must be on a, a non-hostile network. Well, Jesus, you know, sorry, I shouldn't say Jesus. You know, it's like if you're on a non-hostile network, well, of course no one's going to hack into you because it's non-hostile, right? Can anyone say Edward Snowden? There. That's pretty much the end of the talk. Um, Oracle data redaction can be bypassed. There is now a patch for it. It was patched um, in July. You can go and get the patch if you're using or relying on Oracle data redaction. And if you are not happy with Oracle's performance, vote with your checkbook. You know, vote with your pocketbook. Hold your, your vendors to a higher standard. And, and make sure that in the year 2014, they're, they're doing better. OK? So I'll step off my soapbox now. Any questions after all that? Sure. It sounds like the, the redaction is done dynamically and not part of the mechanisms. That's correct. Yeah. So the data is not being changed in any form or fashion. It's just what's being presented to the end user, essentially. So the, the data is still in that you know, data block as 
Ford, 2111, and whatever kind of thing. It's just the, the, the policy basically turned around and said, oh, they've requested that column, so let's on the fly convert them to Xs. Oh, there's other issues with here, by the way. If you have pr privileges on the, the DBMS Redact package, you can create policies in other people's, uh, in other schemas, basically, or I I indeed undo them. Uh, and we can use this as a lateral SQL injection vector as well. So if someone has uh, concatenated a number, for example, uh, and there are a few flaws that Oracle are currently fixing, we can use the redaction. We can create a policy that basically says, instead of sending numbers back and have them embedded, send like some arbitrary SQL kind of stuff. So it, 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 it itself becomes an attack mechanism through, for things like lateral SQL injection. So. But yeah, the, the data, as in answer to your question, has not been changed. It's just the way it's presented to the end user. Any other? No. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll come back. Sure. To be fair, I, I wouldn't call these exploits because they're really lame, you know? Um, th th carry on. Uh, in, in terms of uh, the, like, looking at functions that you might be able to use to bypass reduction and stuff like that. Well, uh, th there might be a product. I, I, there is no product that I'm aware of. It's just, you know, bang away and hacking on it. You know, a human is much better than a, a machine anyway, you know. In fact, Oracle have a, uh, some tools that they use. They made some great investment into that, you know, improving security. And as I said, they've done well in certain areas. Like, most PL SQL injection has, has vanished. They've done them. It's where it switches from like PL SQL to Java or PL SQL to C. It's these boundaries where they're still a bit fuzzy on, uh, or you know things like numeric lateral SQL injection because they up until recently they didn't think it was exploitable until I wrote a paper on it and showed it was still exploitable kind of thing or was exploitable. Um, but yeah, I mean a human's going to be better than uh, any tool to find these kind of things. Sure, the guy in the blue shirt, and then I'll come to you behind, sir. Right, right now it is, Ooh, what does that mean? Right now it's useful. Um, to, to be fair, it was still useful beforehand because you know, you had to know about these bypass issues anyway, kind of, you know. Um, are there more methods of bypassing it? Probably, based upon Oracle's track history. Uh, I, I personally don't have the, um, Yeah, based upon their track history, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I'd, I, if they've gone and done a full product review, I'd be very surprised because that's not the way Oracle do things as far as security is concerned. They fix bugs as they're sent to people, you know, as they're sent bugs by people, they, they get fixed there. And then two lines, as I said, down the of code later on, a, a similar issue exists, kind of, you know. So I, I'm not confident. Short question? Correct. It's not encrypted. It, it's just redacted. Well, if you're PCI compliant, you shouldn't be storing credit card information as well. I don't want this to be a focus on credit card stuff. I just wanted to make some yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if if you're a merchant then and you're taking credit card information, you shouldn't be storing credit card information anyway, as per the PCI requirements. You know, so. Yeah, well, they, they should be encrypted. If you happen to do something like that, you really should be encrypting. But would we encrypt that on Oracle, or would we use a third-party application to encrypt that in storage? Well, see, so here's the thing. Uh, it's, I know some bugs that allow me to get full privileges over the database server, so even if you're encrypting it, I can get the information back out. You know, if... Uh, if when the database has been started up, you know, they've provided the password for the wallet and everything like that, and, you know, things like transparent data encryption is all going on in the background, you know, we can, we can get that data out in an un unencrypted fashion and stuff like that. Um, so I would look to rely on external parties for encryption personally. But again, you're still going to have that level of, for the application to be usable, there, there must be some level of encryption, decryption. So that where, where are those keys and stuff? So, yeah. It, it, uh, there's no one uh, solution fits all, um, and we'll, you know, if, if you want to take it offline, we can have a long discussion over email and stuff like that. But uh, this is probably not the forum for that right now. Thanks. Sure. So 
No, uh, no, they, they didn't. And to be fair, they're not supported products anymore, you know? But the, the, exactly. So the, the best you can do is actually, because Oracle, when, when a, a bug is found, Oracle don't give out any information. So you're left going, well, how do I protect against this, even though I'm running an unsupported product kind of thing? So I, I'm personally of the school of thought that this information needs to be put into the public domain so people can actually come up with risk mitigation strategies, even in the, the absence of a vendor spy patch. But Oracle, again, that school of thought where it's like, Batten down the hatches, everyone needs to shut up, kind of thing. And I, I just disagree with that. Sure, question? Yeah, well, they, they might not use the same language because they don't want to be seen dead using the same language as Microsoft, you know? But yeah, they, they, they've got internal processes that shouldn't be doing this kind of stuff, you know? In fact, they, they, they blog about it, they pay lip service to it, but the results don't show that, you know? Uh, precisely. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that's, that's the only takeaway I have from this talk is that they, the, this is not rocket science I've done here. This is simple. That's why I would never call them exploits because, you know, they're, n they're not, you know. But it's being built as a security feature despite people saying, oh, but it's not a security feature. Well, they're selling it as a security feature in the, the most secure database server, you know. So if you're not going to sell something as a security feature, you know, don't put all your security improvements in Oracle 12C, because it's not, you know, it either is or it isn't. M make up your mind, kind of, you know. But yeah, a, a simple pen test should have found this, and guess what? It, it took people like me or Alexander Cornbrust to find it and report it. That's not what you want in 2014. You don't want external parties reporting problems in your, in your, in your products. You want to have closed those holes down before you ship. I would have thought. Any other questions? Did you, you had enough, yeah. Um, what you're describing sounds like a hack that a company that spent millions of dollars on a query gateway product is to solve exactly that sort of problem. Why, why would they not have leveraged other things like you or, 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 or do they share any information with you whatsoever once you report about it? No. And here's, here's another problem. I didn't really want to bring it up. I'm going to bring it up anyway since you, since you touch on it. I've, I've, one of the flaws I have is, is, is critical. Uh, it allows public to gain full control of the database as, as sys, okay? And I was flabbergasted when I saw this, and I actually said to them, first, why are you doing this? I, I, I'm not going to talk about the bug because, uh, because of you know, those things that I've said. It can allow anyone on the database to get sys privileges. I said to them, why on earth would you do this? What, show me the documentation, and guess what? They can't find any documentation either. They've got no idea why they're setting in this database that allows the public to gain full control of SIS. They've got no documentation on it. That's worrying, you know, as far as I'm concerned. It will all become clear in a, in a couple of months when you know, I, I, I publish you know, what, the, what the floor is, when Oracle uh, actually fix it. But it, it's scary that there's no documentation internally on, as to why this setting has been made. So, any other? I think we've uh, finishing about 13 minutes early. Unless there are any other questions? What's, what's I find uh, a bit, I wouldn't say scary, but uh, worrying maybe is that they do a lot of other products than databases, and are these things can they be found in, for example, their identity system? Yeah. Probably. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and with that so license? I was downloading or attempting to download um, an Oracle product, Oracle Fusion manage, uh, for Oracle Fusion uh, Media Pack. 72 gigabytes, right? That's 72 gigabytes of attack service for Oracle Fusion applications. That's scary. I mean, how? Where do you get 72 gigabytes of application code from? You know? Yeah, maybe. Uh, big pictures or something, I don't know. Big JPEGs. But anyway, uh, so yeah, and all their other products, whether it be uh, access management or e-business suite or whatever, there is massive, massive amounts of attack service. And I think what's happened is they've had 
some really great ideas, you know, and they've thought, yeah, we can bring this to the internet. We can allow this functionality to happen and people will be able to do business better, but they've done it with so much excitement, they've forgot about security, you know? So it's all about getting the product shipped and stuff so we can enable our customers. That's all very well and good, providing you do it in a secure fashion. So, you know, if we look at the, um, the difference between Microsoft and uh, Oracle, I think that's what, what the issue is. Microsoft are doing great as far as the, you know, the, the server side of things is concerned. Forget IE. They, they should have dumped IE a long time ago, in my opinion. Uh, it's, you know, it's really difficult to secure something if an attacker has full control over it in terms of things like scripting. So you're always going to have you know, problems with that. But if we look at Microsoft Exchange Server, when was the last time you saw a decent bug in Microsoft Exchange Server? Version 5.5, like a, 10 years ago? Internet Information Server, when was the last time you saw a buffer overflow in an Internet Information Server? EI days, you know? When was the last time you saw, uh, it doesn't matter, you get the point, okay? Microsoft are doing great on the server side of things, perhaps not so much on the, on the client side of things. Uh, and with SQL Server, they've done triply great, you know, in my opinion. Okay, any other questions? What, was that, I saw a hand go up there. <laughs> Scratching his head. Right, okay, thank you very much, everybody. I hope this has been of use, and uh, enjoy the rest of your time. <laughs>